when we talk about coaching and programming, oftentimes endurance athletes or particularly runners fall on the furthest end of the spectrum from our high force strength athletes. So we typically see the training of a runner being the furthest away possible as the training of a weightlifter or a powerlifter. Now, although this is true in certain aspects, one of the main things we have to look at is the S&C sessions of running athletes or the S&C sessions of athletes who want to be able to run efficiently, effectively or quickly. When we look at runners and when we look at their physiological makeup, the main things we tend to look at are their VO2 max, their running efficiency, what their posture looks like and what their gait looks like. But there are many other valuable areas that we can look to improve or to maximize for those athletes. And one of the key areas is their gym training and specifically their force production capacity and their speed and power values. Now, we get this question all the time. I'm a recreational 5K runner. I'm a triathlete. What should my in-season gym sessions look like? I think for many of us, we can conceptually plan out our off-season sessions quite easily. We might need to gain leg strength. We might need to gain upper body power. We might need to look at some injuries that weren't addressed during the season. But now when we look in season, so when we're doing a lot of running volume, a lot of race pace work, probably a lot of interval training at those slightly faster paces, the planning of our in-gym work, our lifting work, our plyometrics becomes a small bit more complex and the opportunity for contrasting to happen is far, far higher. Today what we're doing is looking at a sample session the kind of ideal case for a running athlete or a track athlete and what they'd be doing in the middle of their running season. So maybe you have five big races you want to run this year. This will be a kind of sample gym session you run for 90% of those weeks. Obviously, we don't intend for this session to be run at nauseam. This would only be a single session in possibly two sessions per week you're going to run for your 16 or 20 week season and obviously this session would change in terms of the sets reps and loading you would use throughout but this should give you a good idea for roughly what we're looking for up first in this session is some low impact plyometric work now this is the perfect place for us to start we're assuming we have done our general warm-up, so the athlete has come into the gym, they've raised their core body temperature, they have an elevated heart rate and increased blood pressure, the athlete should be slightly out of breath, and they should be noticeably sweating. So oftentimes when we get athletes who aren't specifically strength training, and we ask them to warm up for their strength training activities, they don't often give it much heedance because they think, oh, I'm just moving a barbell around or I'm just doing some jumps. I don't really need to pay attention to my circulatory system or my cardiovascular warm-up. So usually come into the gym, we'll hop on the bike or a rowing machine or an erg of some sort for around 10 to 15 minutes, get those body temperatures up and make sure we're prepped for exercise. The first exercise in terms of our low impact plyometrics are very simple plate hops. These plate hops are doing a couple of things and they do it very, very efficiently. So the first thing they're doing is they are preparing our lower body and those joints and motor units for exercise. So this is basically taking a general warm-up and now transitioning into more of a specific warm-up. There's other benefits to this kind of plate hop as well, such as agility or coordination of our feet. I even see this improving athletes who have very, very poor gait and poor stride, them just becoming more efficient and more effective with that foot placement for jumping on and off a plate can make big differences when they get to running on a track or when they just get to running on the road. Now, the second thing that this warm-up is doing for us is it's preparing our central nervous system. So at the start of these in-season training sessions, what we will have is some power and speed work. And one of the main things that's going to move the needle on those power and speed sessions is how prepped and how ready our central nervous system and our peripheral nervous systems are to fire as many of those neurotransmitters down our spinal cord as possible. So making sure we're ready, making sure we're alert and making sure those reaction times are going to be as fast as possible for our later more advanced plyo movements 
all starts with these small plate hops. So up next, we have some drop jumps. So I'm taking a small hop down off a plate, basically bringing some velocity into the equation before I start. I'll then hit the ground and jump up onto another plate. Now, I like this variation, particularly like this variation using plates or very scalable plyo boxes, because it will allow me to firstly control the height I'm dropping from. So this controls the ground reactive forces that I'm going to be interacting with in that first hop. And also what it does is it controls that jump height I'm going to have to have afterwards. A lot of the time we see box jumps or drop jumps being used and we're not really controlling the outcome of it. We ask athletes to be as fast as possible coming off the floor, but also we ask them to be as high as possible in the resulting jump and oftentimes these things are hard to track. Using plates for both the initial drop and the secondary jump is very, very valuable for this. This will be classified as a combination of power and speed work. So the rate of force development or how quickly we can do work is obviously very, very important here. But this is relatively unweighted. It's very, very fast in their reaction time. It's basically just utilizing that stretch shortening cycle. And so for that reason, it is far higher on that force velocity curve than some of the later exercises. Moving on then, we have a straight-legged box jump. Usually, the straight-legged box jump is going to be done at a significantly lower height than what we see athletes normally doing for their box jump. And there's a couple of key parameters we want to look at here. So the first thing is the athlete should be aiming to jump as high and as quickly as humanly possible. So swinging their arms is definitely a big benefit here. Utilizing as much of a dip and drive with their legs is definitely beneficial here. We really don't want to put any constraints on how high the athlete is going to jump. The big thing we're going to do, and this is the only constraint over the course of this entire exercise, is ensure that the athlete is jumping with almost straight legs. So you'll see here, Owen is accelerating up, jumping up onto that box, and he is not landing in a deep squat position. He should have almost straight knees, so a small, a few degrees of flexion in the knees just to absorb any impact. He should have almost straight ankles, so we don't want the heels landing flat on the box, but we also don't want to be really flexing at the ankle and kind of exaggerating that range of motion. Now, the reasons we do this are twofold. The first thing is this style of straight-legged box jump forces us to raise our center of mass far higher than the standard box jump where I basically jump up and tuck my legs up as quickly as possible. This is incredibly important for you as a running athlete because it will force you to generate as much power as humanly possible. In certain cases where we have athletes jumping onto very high boxes into very deep squats, it becomes a skill development exercise. So rather than focusing on just jumping as high as possible, the athlete then might cut the amount of power in their initial jump and focus on pulling their feet up more quickly in order to scoot themselves up onto the box more efficiently. Now, the second reason we do this is that it makes for a far more scalable exercise. So the big thing we need to be tracking with our in-season training sessions is making sure that the athlete isn't massively decaying in their values. So whether that be speed values, power values, or strength values. And this is one of the great exercises to do this with. So if you know you train in the same gym all the time, maybe you're going to use four 20 kilo bumper plates and a five kilo bumper plate for the height of your straight legged box jump. Now suddenly you'll come into the gym in one week's time or two weeks time or three weeks time and you can no longer do four 20s and a five. You have an immediate value for if your jump or if your power values are increasing or decreasing. Now the other scalable thing with the plates is that I can easily make this safer or more importantly I can not be in an unsafe position. So a lot of the time with a set plyo box I am just going to be jumping onto that box and hoping for the best. I'll probably have to pull my feet up a small bit. This is the same reason we don't want you doing a deep squat when you land is because there is an increased risk of injury that comes along with that.
Now, this is a value that will be omnipresent throughout all of our in-season S&C work, and that is ensuring there is as little risk to the athlete as possible. This goes for uh, delayed onset muscle soreness, so making sure we're not smashing the athlete with a lot of volume and a lot of intensity, but also goes for the actual risk of the exercise itself. So making sure that exercise isn't in some way inherently more likely to cause injury or cause harm than a different exercise they could be doing. Now, this isn't always the case. If we have an off-season athlete and they need to make large changes quickly, then you're going to be really delving into that kind of overreaching type of training, mostly in the in-season period, we're not going to be going there. We're not pushing the athletes very hard. Mostly, if we have a semi-experienced athlete, they're going to be focusing on maintaining speed, power, and strength variables, and they're not going to be pushing really hard. Now, if you're in the more amateur or novice category of athlete, then it's very likely you will still be increasing those values as you go through the in-season period, but it's very important that our priorities are always to limit risk, limit the risk of us not being able to run, and thus limit the risk of us not being able to compete in the future. Now, moving on from this section, we have our main strength training piece of the session, and in this case, it's high bar back squats. So you'll see here, Owen is doing a full depth high bar back squat, no pauses, no alteration in tempo, no box, no facilitators, anything along those lines. It's standard high bar back squatting. Now, usually what we're looking for here is we're looking for very good quality of movement. Then we want a certain amount of volume throughout the session. And then we want an effective intensity for that volume to happen at. And it always goes in that order. So firstly, if you have an athlete and they can't do good quality back squats to an appropriate depth, that's your immediate area of focus. Then once you can achieve that high quality back squat to an appropriate depth, you go on to an amount of volume that's going to be effective. So in most cases here, you're going to be going somewhere around five by five, then dropping to a three by five, then going to five sets of three, then going to three sets of three, and you can run through those four sessions, just resetting each time you go back to five by five. Once you've achieved that, and once the athlete has the capacity to do high quality squats at that volume, then we can start pushing the intensity a small bit. So if you are beginning into this in-season period, and you know that it's going to take you a small while to get back to squatting, find a weight that you can do for five by five, and you can stick with that for a number of weeks and then slowly add that intensity. Same way you might add 5% or 10% to the weight. You can then go from 5 by 5 to 3 sets of 5 with the increased weight. Then next week, maybe add that 10% again and go from 3 sets of 5 to 5 sets of 3. And then the week after that, add the 10% again. Go from 5 sets of 3 to 3 sets of 3. So what are we looking at here with these back squats and what might be slightly different from off-season style squats? The big thing for runners here is the speed the barbell is moving at. So this is a very trackable metric. You can use a barbell tracker on your phone and it will give you a very good idea from the videos if you're having an extreme amount of slowing down or speeding up as you go through the reps. The more accurate way of getting this will be like a linear force transducer or it's some way of tracking the speed of the barbell. And this is where these kind of individual markers come in. So if you know that as you're going through a training session, you might have a velocity meter or you might just be looking at the videos on your phone, but you know that 100 kilos for a set of five usually looks a certain speed. If I now come in and today I'm going to do 100 kilos for a set of five and it's significantly slower, it's very important that I reduce the intensity of that and then redo the squats. So in this case, I'm supposed to do five sets of five reps at 100 kilos. I come into the gym due to fatigue or due to a race the previous week. I'm not able to do it to a speed that I am happy with. Then I go and maybe I take 10% off and go for 90 kilos and I'll do my remaining four sets of five at that 90 kilos. It is very important we prioritize speed in the in-season sessions. To continue on with this theme of kind of personal metrics, 
keeping a diary as you're training is so, so valuable. So a simple notebook or a copy book to jot down your notes in, you can keep it at the gym or keep it in your gym bag so it's always with you. And certain things to keep in mind when you're looking at this is how fast the barbell tends to move on my first set versus second set. A lot of the time the second set will actually move faster than it did on the first. Also, having a look at first set versus last set will give you a very good idea for how quickly your work capacity decays over the course of the session. Now, this could be valuable data in terms of how it informs your future training blocks, but also it should be looked at as valuable data in terms of how you interact with the weights during the sessions themselves. If you can usually smash out five sets and there's no real change in speed and now suddenly I get a big decay at set four or set five, this should be a noteworthy point for you and you should investigate it pretty much immediately. The opposite of this holds true as well where if usually you're slowing down at set three, four or five and today you notice you can smash through set four, smash through set five and the barbell is moving just as quickly or it feels like it's moving just as quickly, then you should just as often take note of that occurrence. What did you do in the day previous to that session? What was your nutrition like? What was your sleep like? Did you introduce a new variable into the, the equation? Was there an introduction of intra-workout carbohydrates that made a difference? And note those things. These small 1% differences make a massive difference over time. Finally then, we have a superset of some assistance work. So this is Bulgarian split squats, supersetted with Russian twists. Now, I'm sure all of you have seen these two exercises before. If you've run our programs, you might have seen these two exercises in a superset before. But why might we be using these in an in-season session? So the first thing is the Bulgarian split squat is massively beneficial for our runners. The first thing is that it builds stability around the hip and the knee. So when we look at running values, particularly in the more endurance side of things, 5k, 10k, half marathon, we're really looking at our ability to maintain posture even when we're under muscular fatigue. So the breaking down of our upper body and lower body postures makes a massive difference to how efficient we are while running and obviously all runners will know how important efficiency values are for maintaining good running speeds later on into those races. The second thing the Bulgarian split squat does for us is it really opens up the hip. So because that trailing leg is up on a bench, it's going to focus that full or terminal hip extension at the top and the bottom of the rep. And that is massively beneficial when we look at lengthening strides or decreasing stride rate for the more endurance runner. Finally then, is a general increase in balance or an increase in how well we can balance when on uneven surfaces. So because we're using a kettlebell, because we're loading one side of the body, we do have a certain contrast going on with the load here where we have a lot of midline stability work going on. My left side is supporting a dumbbell, my right side is planted on the floor. So there is a lot of valuable balance work being done with the Bulgarian split squat. Now, that brings up the next point, and that is how should you load these, and the best way for runners to load a Bulgarian split squat will be with a dumbbell or a kettlebell or some sort of weighted implement in one or two hands. So firstly, why do we want it to be in our hands and not on our back? The reason is very simple. Firstly, is it brings our combined center of mass lower down and allows us to balance more effectively. So because our center of mass isn't quite so high and because we're not a specifically strength training athlete, we get more benefit from having that weight lower down and being able to put a bit more force in because of that. Now, the second thing is having the weight in one hand versus the weight in two. The weight in one hand really does come down to a core stability thing and a bit of a balance thing as well. So always the leg that's planted on the floor is the opposite side to the side that is supporting the weight. Now, onto the Russian twists. Why would we use Russian twists for a runner? So the first thing here is obviously building the core, building the midline, building that work capacity in the midline to allow us to maintain better posture later in the race, to allow us to have better running efficiency later in the race, and then eventually have better running times because of that. Now, the second reason is the specific training of the hip flexors to allow us to have that nice long running stride, that very efficient running stride that the hip flexor and rec fem are so, so essential for. 
Finally, then, the use of the Russian twist is really in that rotation and anti-rotational strength we gain from it. Obviously, as all of you will know, there's a lot of anti-rotational and rotational strength needed for running, particularly at the faster paces. But having the ability to maintain a straightforward torso while our hips are articulating and our legs are trying to force us to rotate is one of the main reasons humans are so, so good at running when we contrast that to most other animals. So the ability for our hips to articulate and for our torso to articulate but fight against that is massively beneficial. If you'd like more information like this, make sure you subscribe to Seek Your Strength. If you're an athlete, so a track and field athlete, a runner, or somebody who wants to focus more on their SNC work, we have an upcoming camp. All the details of that SNC camp are in the description of this video. It is at the end of May. Make sure you send us an email, seekyourstrength at gmail.com for more details.